one of you. What a joy it is to be together again. There is just nothing better than coming together with God's people and just rejoicing in who he is. Now that is what uh, this next series is all about, is knowing your God. The study on the seven seals it has a lot of mystery wrapped around it and certainly involves many things that the majority of the church is not aware of. And so we don't want to be that part of the church. And so the Lord's put on my heart that we need to know him in these apocalyptic prophecies because the value of prophecy is that it acquaints us with the person. It's not about timelines. It's about knowing God. What you know about God affects your conduct. If you believe that God is a tyrant, just looking down on you to zap you, it affects your conduct. If you think that God is a Santa Claus, just here to, to, to fulfill your every whim, then that affects your conduct. But we need to understand and know what the Bible says about who God is. One of the, the things that we have to be aware of at all times is that the Bible often tells us things that we don't want to hear and we don't want to know. True or false? Yes. I am so glad you said true because that is the truth, is that the Bible tells us things that we don't want to hear. And God wants for us to know the truth about who he is. And there's nothing like the book of life and the seven seals to bring incredible revelation about who the God family is that we profess to serve. If this is your first time to look into these matters, then I'm going to have to ask you to be willing to hear some things that maybe you haven't heard before and be willing to listen before you throw it out. Remember, any time that you study and hear a, a Bible study or a sermon, listen. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you discernment, you can always pitch it, truly. I mean, we each choose what we want to know and believe about God. He's given us that right. You have to know if you want to be a wise man of this generation and know what the Bible says about God. Now, we many of us have, have taken on belief and a belief system about who God is just because we've gotten it through, through our heritage, through our church, through our family, and we really don't know why we believe what we believe. And so this is a time for us at, to come together as a church and to be clear, be clear about what the Bible is telling you, what the Bible is telling me about who our God is. Welcome to our online family. We miss those of you that aren't here today, and we welcome those of you that are part of our online family all over the globe, and we're so grateful to know that you are joining us today and that we can worship together in spirit and in truth. So you can't uh, study the seven seals without really understanding the book of life. That's why the last two messages have been about the book of life. No, it's, it's incredible. And any time I look at this, it's always overwhelming. There, the subject is so huge because God is so huge. And it's always a, a turmoil in my soul as to how things are going to be presented. And, and even though I can study it for hours and hours and hours, I never know exactly what the Lord's going to bring in the moment because the subject is priceless and it's huge and it's glorious because it's about God. Now, the seven seals get more attention than the book of life. Truly. The seven seals have this mystery about them and we tend to forget 
that the seven seals are on a scroll or on a sealed book and that they are, they are holding shut some secret information that is inside this book or this scroll that the Father has written? Do we contemplate why this book is necessary? That's very important because the book of life is a crucial part of apocalyptic prophecy. Incredible things are going on along the way of being able to open up this book. And as each seal is opened, a tremendous truth about Jesus is revealed. The exalted purpose of this book gives the seven seals their importance. The reason that the seven seals have value is because they are attached to the book of life. So just quick review about the last two weeks as we get into this very heavy uh, subject is knowing that the book of life is a history book. The father wrote it. Uh, it's the difference between foreknowledge and predestination. Foreknowledge is a prerogative, a power of God that only the Father has. And he's written this book and he has sealed the information of the entire history of angels and human beings in this book. We looked at that the last two weeks. So if you want to know a little bit more about that, if you weren't able to join us, please go back and look. It's very important that we understand that God has written our choices down, but he's not predestined our choices. You and I have the right to choose a tremendous power that God has given everyone of his children, the power to submit to his authority, the power to love him and know his love, or the power to reject and rebel against all that is righteous and holy. You and I have that right given to us by God. The book of life reveals the depth that, of love of the father for his children, knowing Everyone's choices ahead of time does not affect God's love and his benevolence toward creation. Is that not incredible? He knew that his first child would become his worst enemy, and he did nothing to stop the creation of that first child. And every other wicked, rebellious child that would be filled with violence and bring harm to those around them, he has allowed each child to have the right to choose, and he loves each one of us anyway. Do you know that about your God this morning? Do you know that he loves you no matter what? And he is desiring to save you no matter what. And he can only do that if you cooperate with him, and if you are willing, if you will be my people, then I will be your God. That's the covenant. So we have to enter into that covenant with him, and he gives us that right. He loves us whether we enter into that covenant or not. That is an incredible thing to know about your God. That should make you love God even more. Now, what is our love based on? We say we love God. What is that based on? Because maybe God's answered a couple of prayers that were significant to us or because God gives us the things that we want from time to time or that God supplies our needs. What is your love for God based on? Is it based on his presence, who he is, or on his presence, what he can give you? Because if it's not based on who he is, then there will be trouble and we will be a part of those who fall away when the testing time comes. The book of life also ensures that God himself lives by his law. He lives by the royal law and by the law of love. Incredible. When Adam and Eve sinned, the father knew that they would sin. The father knew that there would be great cost to his family, that Jesus would have to suffer, that the father would suffer, that the Holy Spirit would suffer in order to redeem humanity. 
Wow, an incredible thing to behold. But for the sake of oncoming generations, for hundreds and thousands and billions of years, the Father foresaw that he, we would have to suffer during this little bit of time in the span of 6,000 years of sin on, on Earth's, on this planet, so that for billions of years we would know that God is love. Not because he says he is love, but because he has demonstrated in everything that he does, he has demonstrated himself to be love. Tremendous. And at the end of time, during that white, uh, that great white throne scene that Revelation 20 talks about, when the book of life is finally opened after the thousand years that we are in heaven with Jesus, it will be revealed that the Father, for he, even though he could foresee all the choices, he loved each person regardless. And that each person that is outside the city that is lost is only lost because they refused his love. He did everything that he could to redeem every single person. Can, can you not totally love a God that is willing to go over and beyond to save those that ignore him day to day? Because if we, you and I were God, we certainly wouldn't um, run our government that way. And as, we're, as we've seen, Lucifer will not run his government that way when he takes over during the Great Tribulation. So understanding these things about God is tremendous, tremendous. Uh, please open up your Bibles this morning to the book of Daniel. Because in order to know and understand some very tremendous things about God, we are going to look at things in Daniel 7 and in Revelation 4 and 5. And the story of the seven seals and the book of life and the tremendous um, scene that God allows both Daniel and John to view is, is amazing. And that you and I know these things, wow. So Daniel 7 Daniel 7 is a story about, God is talking about the rise and fall of kingdoms. But in the middle of these, talking about these, um, these beasts, Daniel says, he sees this horrible monster with these horns, and then he's watching. He, he looks here. And then he looks over here, and he looks over here. And many times when God is taking him to look at different things, it's because he wants to get some timing established. And that's really cool about God. But you won't catch that if you're just a casual Bible reader. You're only going to get this if you give these prophecies their due time. It takes time to understand all of these pieces. So my job is to try to whet your appetite to want to dig in for yourself. Not to believe what I'm saying, to say, these are kind of outlandish things, because really, if they weren't in the Bible, they would be so sci-fi, honestly. It's, it's so out there, the things that the Bible tells us. J uh, Daniel says, I watched this horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High. Now, I'm going to tell you that this is talking about the Dark Ages and the end of the Dark Ages when, when God puts a stop on the, uh, the Roman Catholic Empire that was uh, persecuting the saints through the French Revolution. Uh, Napoleon and his uh, officers, they take the Pope captive and thus the chains that existed there are broken and the time frame is established. So this is 1798 and I'm just going to give you that so that you can have a, a, a time frame because I want to, what I want to get to is this and this is here in Daniel um, 7 9. As I looked and then he sees thrones were set in place and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool, 
thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousands stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. The other place where you see that books being opened and judgment happening is in Revelation 20. So I just want you to have this in mind, that books, plural, is open because this is talking about judgment. I want you to note that the Ancient of Days, the Father is seen as the Ancient of Days. How, how can God describe to Daniel just the Father's glorious presence? Remember that the Father is invisible. God, Jesus says clearly, oh, if you're not God, you can't see God. And the Father is invisible. But we get a, a view, a little view of something of what God is like because there's something going to take place that is crucial for us to get. And in fact, the church is lost on this subject. And it's so huge. goes on to say, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. So you have the Ancient of Days sitting, and you have another being coming into the scene, and he approaches. Can you count how many we're talking about? Yes, two. Two. This very subject is the subject of why the Jews wanted to kill Jesus. This subject here, of there being more than one being. But Daniel and then Revelation 4 and 5 make it so clear. If we're not willing to see beyond just what we've been spoon-fed to get to the truth, we miss so much about who God is. And why I'm saying this is because we need to be building our confidence and our faith in God. We're living in a, a time of earth's history, especially we can look all around us and life has changed. And life's going to keep changing. And there is tremendous change coming when God enters into the last phase of earth's history. And if we are not confident in who God is as a church, I'm not talking about those out there that don't know God. I'm talking to the choir here. Those of us singing praises. Those of us singing hallelujahs. What are we singing about? Who do we know? Jesus has warned us that many during the time of the end are going to betray him and turn away from the faith. Why? Because they never really knew him. And so God in turn will say, I don't know you. You never knew me. You, you believed deception. You never took the time to find out who I am and why I'm doing the things that I'm going to do. So here we see the father sitting with thousands and thousands and millions and billions of angels this courtroom scene is being set because the court was seated and books are opened. So there's a judgment going to happen. And we only, this is all we get here. The rest is found in the book of Revelation. Understand that the second coming does not exist in the Old Testament. There's no second coming. This book is supposed to be sealed up until the time of the end. If the Jews had accepted Messiah, the book of Daniel would never have been opened up. Remember, seal the book, Daniel. It's for the time of the end. Go your way. Daniel doesn't know that, you know, remember he's praying about the 70 weeks. God's going to give Israel a chance to accept Messiah and to bring salvation and to bring everything into fulfillment. But you and I have the rest of the story, and we know that God's people rejected him. He came into his own, and his own knew him not. They rejected him. And so understanding these things, it gives me great confidence in who God is. He's a God that is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's not arbitrary. He's not just making stuff up as he goes along. 
The plan is right here. It's all right here. And you know what this does? It helps us not to live in fear because the devil is all about fear. And knowing who God is and how he operates keeps us from living in fear and being fearful children. We need to be confident in who he is and in what his plan is. Okay, so in walks the Son of Man. He was given. He's given something that he didn't already have. This is crucial. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power, and all nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Wow. So we get this little snapshot. And what this does, Daniel, it cements the timing for the book of Revelation. There's a lot more. We're looking at this little piece. Daniel is the foundational timing that the book of Revelation sits on. And to to delve into these things and to study them is of great, great benefit to you and I. So Daniel and John see the same scene. So let's go to the book of Revelation. Chapter 4. So I want for us to dig into this this morning. We'll see how far we get today. Verse 1. And he's, after the, the messages to the seven churches, John's writing all this down, and then he's shown something else. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once... I was in the spirit. Remember like Ezekiel was once in the spirit. And there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. Because we know who was sitting on it, right? Because we just looked at the book of Daniel. Daniel tells us who's sitting on it. It's the ancient of days. And one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald, encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, more details, same scene. And seated on them were 24 elders. Now, if you're a good Bible student, you know that where judgment is involved, two or three witnesses are required to pass sentence, right? And so we have... 24 elders, two per tribe. 12 tribes, 24 elders. They are witnessing. They are witnesses of all that God is going to do. This is another tremendous thing to know about God. He doesn't do things in secret. He does everything in full view. He wants, because that, that's what love is. Love is transparent. There is no love in darkness. God is transparent in everything that he does. He wants for us to be clued into what he does, to what he is doing, how he operates, how he judges, what he, what he has in store for us. He wants for us to know. And so he sets these thrones in place. Seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white. What does that tell you about them? Yes, they're pure. They're pure. They're sin-free. They have been sealed. We know that when Jesus in um, Ephesians 4.32, I think, Jesus led captives in his train. Jesus took with him some of the holy people that came out of their tombs. He sealed them and he took them to heaven for this very purpose, just for for you to have an understanding of who they are. They have crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, 
rumblings, and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Seven spirits of God. Seven angels. It says they're ablaze because they're so bright. These are the seven angels that are in charge of the seven churches that have the seven or given the seven trumpets and that deliver the seven bowls. Yes. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. What a tremendous thing to behold. How could you even go on with life after that? It's so amazing. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes. What is being covered with eyes? Very significant detail given here for us to understand who the four living creatures are. And I don't, this isn't going to become a study on the four living creatures, but the four living creatures, I know, this is so many tangents. These are the same four living creatures that Ezekiel saw. And the reason that God acquainted Ezekiel with the four living creatures in detail, I mean, we're talking detail, is because God's people, Israel, had rejected the Holy Spirit. And the message that God had for Ezekiel and all, you know, Ezekiel is, is the prophet of pantomimes. He, he acts things out because he was so shy. But God makes clear that they have rejected the Holy Spirit. And so the four living creatures represent the Holy Spirit. Having eyes all around is to be all-knowing. Nobody but God is all-knowing. God didn't create any kind of creature that has that ability. Only deity is all-knowing. I know, as I said, remember I told you guys a disclaimer when you started listening. If this is new, just listen because the story is going to get better, but you have to buckle up your seatbelts. The four living creatures that were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. And the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings, was covered with eyes all around, even under the wings. So when they're flying, they have flight. They're seeing everything everywhere. It's a representation. It's not the Holy Spirit's invisible. So God, when God wants us to know the work of the Spirit, he gives us like a caricature so that we can understand the work of a being that is invisible. Day and night, these four living creatures never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now, these four living creatures have authority because when the four living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne, the 24 elders do what? They fall down and worship, and they cast their crowns. So, you know what it's like to try to find any kind of pictures of someone who actually understands what Revelation story is really about. But I, I love this. It's, it's a little bit of us to understand that God gives us this very, with, I'll talk about this next week, the significance for why these four faces are there. I want to really focus on this other part, that when the four living creatures, when they start saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The 24 elders bow. So it's an authority, a voice of authority as well that lends everyone there to worship and to bow down and to cast their crowns, just like you and I will do one day. We will cast our crowns because we don't even deserve to be there. We've been given righteousness. We have been given life. We've been given eternity, and we will gladly bow just like this and cast our crowns to the one who paid the price and to the one whose love is endless and who is extravagant beyond comprehension. They lay their crowns before the throne and they say, you are worthy 
our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they are created and have their being. They're giving glory and praise to the Father because the Father is the architect of everything. He created the world through Jesus, but all architecture is from the Father. The plan is from the Father. Jesus carries out the plan, and he's the actual creator. He actually spoke. He actually molded with his hands the Father's plan. The Father gave Jesus the blueprint. The architect is not the builder, is he? The architect makes the plan, hands him to the builder. Jesus is the builder. Two separate jobs. Okay, then he sees something else. John says, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? They're looking around. Who? Who can open the scroll? Now, John knows that the contents of this book is significant and that it is very significant to him and that it is very important for the scroll to be opened. You know, God has given, heaven knows about the book of life. Many of Bible writers knew about the book of life. We looked at that last week. And John understands that this is serious. Who is going to do this? And no one is found worthy. Now take note that not even one of the four living creatures can come and take the book. No one. And so what does he do? He wept bitterly. I mean, he weeps and weeps. He said, I wept and wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look inside. Then one of the elders says, comes over to John, don't weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David, he has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and it's seven seals. <sighs> Praise the Lord that Jesus is found worthy. And so he says, I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne. Remember who Daniel said walked into the presence of the Ancient of Days? One that lo looked like a son of man, and that, that is a reference to Jesus, son of man. But John takes it to a different level because John knows things that Daniel didn't know. John knows the rest of the story. And so he sees that there is going to be a handoff Encircled by the four living creatures and the elders, he had seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Daniel 7 and Revelation 4 and 5 challenge the doctrine of the Trinity. It's a false doctrine. One does not always mean a number. When you understand what takes place, you have the Father and you have Jesus. You have two separate beings. In the Trinity doctrine, you would have to have, I take the scroll for myself. Here am I. I hand it to my other hand. You have a God who can't be trusted. You have a God who's written his own book sealed his own book, and opening his own book. Do you understand this? You have to understand that what the Bible teaches is tritheism, three separate. Not trinity, one being with multiple personalities that just pop out whenever. This is crucial to understanding and having confidence in God. And I know I, was, I wasn't raised in understanding this, so I understand that some of you are going, oh, this is crazy. Well, the truth sometimes is crazy right when you hear it. And you have to digest it, kind of like walking in repentance and humility. Not tasty at all. 
I mean, really, what deep things of God are super tasty until you process and allow for the Spirit to change your appetite. Then, whoa, feast, right? Better than the Thanksgiving feast. Yes. So what happens is that the book of life now becomes the Lamb's book of life. It's known as the Lamb's book of life. And this is what happens, and this is crucial, and this is what is missed. The Father is the supreme ruler of the universe. That is his job. He hands to Jesus total power. And he takes a back seat so that Jesus now is in charge. Only one being can be in charge at one time. There's only one, what is it in the corporation? A CEO? Yeah, not two or three. Can't work that way. Why does he do that? Because only Jesus, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, he is the only one who is worthy because he has purchased, he has purchased with his life. He was willing to cease to exist because he loves us so deeply. You and I can't understand a love like that. We don't know that kind of love, but by faith, with the little bit of comprehension that we can have, Wow, is this not amazing? He purchased us with his life. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb now. Remember, they were worshiping the father and now the, ex the transfer happens. Now they're worshiping the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which were the prayers of the saints. And what did they do? They sang a new song. Let me tell you something that's so awesome. In that second, the Holy Spirit gives them that song and they just know it instantly and they start singing it. Right in that moment. That's how it's going to be for us when we, when we get to, probably on our, when Jesus calls us up, we'll start singing songs right then. Songs that we have ne we never knew that the Holy Spirit just instantaneously gives. They start singing a new song. And they say, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Now note that he is given the seven attributes of God. He was slain and worthy is he to receive what? Power, wealth, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and praise. He is given total authority to take care of the sin problem because that is what the book of life will accomplish when all the seals are removed. And so they say to him who sits on the throne, who is who? The ancient of days, and to the lamb, one, Two, be praise and honor and power forever and ever. What happens to set all of this up is so tremendous. This courtroom has been in session since then. Courtroom is in session today as we speak. It is ongoing and it will not stop until all judgment has taken place. We will look at that when we look at the third seal. But for now, understand that God has invited those that are there and us as we read and as we know what's going on, that we know the truth of what's happening and that our God is, has done everything to save every person from the time of the first created angel, from the time of the first created human beings, until the very end. He will do everything he can because he is love. And he wants every person possible 
to be a part of his eternity forever because his love is just that big. And understanding and having total confidence in how the God family, God is a last name. Father God, Creator God, Holy Spirit God. It's a last name of three beings. And when you understand that, you can understand and I can understand if there's a company of three people that in order to have success, each one's going to have to stay in their own lane. Yes? These three gods stay in their own lane. The Father is sovereign. Jesus is the one who dwells with his creation, dwelt with the angels, and then he dwelt with human beings. And now he's been glorified, and now he's found worthy to be judged because he gave everything. And he judges in righteousness and in love. And as he looks at each book that is opened, he looks to see if we're willing to love, uh, love God and to love others. That's judgment is based on love. Because if we're anything like God, we're loving. That, that is what this is about. I want to leave you with this thought just in case um, your head is spinning. So sorry. Some Sabbaths are just like that. If you've been studying this, then I hope I have given you more clarity through, through the words that God has given me this morning of how you can share confidently who God is. If you are looking at this for the first time and you're like, whoa, yeah, I agree. That's, that's what I still say. This is a tremendous subject. You and I have this one book that tells us what God wants for us to know about him right now. Do you know how much more there is? No, I don't. But there's, it's, it's endless. We will never know everything about God or he would cease being God. But this is the important thing. Being able to exist with a God who is ever revealing more of himself, takes faith. We must live by faith. What is our faith based on? Why do you love your God? Why are you here this morning? Why do you worship him? Why do you study the word? Why do you pray? Do you know the God that he wants for us to know him to be? Or are you believing things just because you've been spoon-fed them? If that's where you are, today is day one of learning more truth. And glorify God for his goodness in the fact that he is transparent and he allows us. Wow, we get to look at this and see how great he is. And I'm going to leave you with one scripture that was the death of Jesus from Matthew 26, 64. When Jesus said this before the high priest in the court of the temple, the high priest tore his clothes. They started yelling blasphemy. They punched him in the face and they spit on him. Because Jesus was proclaiming to be a separate and equal God. Who do you say he is this morning? Mm -hmm.